Okay, so in this lecture, we are going to look at uh, the notion of dependence and independence of a set of vectors. So, so if you're given a set of vectors, you know, what are the constraints that these set of vectors come up with, right? So, and this will, this is the, the concept that we introduce here will have very important consequences, which we will explore in the lectures, which will come ahead. Okay, so let's hark back to 2D vectors, simple two-dimensional vectors that we are all familiar with. So, if you have some, any arbitrary vector in the two-dimensional plane, right, which it's something that we take for granted, can be written as, uh, you know, can be expressed in terms of some uh, some scalar along, uh, you know, ma some magnitude along the x direction plus some other scalar quantity times the y direction. There is a unit vector along the y direction and a unit vector along the x direction. So, but in fact, any generic, you know, two vectors which live in a certain plane, right, can act as, you know, these vectors in, in terms of which any other vector in that space can be represented, right. So, as long as they are not parallel, they are not, you know, in the same direction or in the opposite direction, it's possible to write it down, write down any other vector in, the, in that plane in terms of these two vectors, right. So, in fact, let's go ahead and show this. I already have this statement. Show that any vector in a plane can be written as a linear combination of two non-parallel vectors A and B, right. So, if you want to pause the video and, and try to work this out for yourself, covering, you know, whatever little is already showing up in my solution of this, please do so, right. So, we want to write v as some v1 times a plus v2 times b, right. We don't know what v1 and v2 is and we are only given some two vectors a and b, arbitrary vectors. We are told that they are non-parallel, right. So, they are non-parallel. So, there is a cross product of these two vectors, right. So, I assume that all of us are familiar with the notion of a cross product. I didn't explicitly define it for two-dimensional vectors, although I did uh, use the dot product because I think we are all sort of familiar with this from high school. So, let's, I will take this for granted and say that given that these two vectors a and b are not parallel, therefore, there is a cross product that we can find. It is not going to be 0, right. And it is going to, in fact, it is going to represent the direction perpendicular to the plane, right. So, this is also something which I think is not surprising. None of what I am saying right now is going to be surprising, but I am just putting it in a in a form which is, you know, kind of abstract and which will open up, uh, you know, uh, ways for us to make more general statements for linear vector spaces. Okay, so A cross B is a vector which is going to be perpendicular to both A and B, right, and that's the point. So, if you are able to find a vector which is perpendicular to both A and B, you have managed to find, define the plane. So, if there are, there are two vectors are, which live in this plane and which are not parallel are enough to define the plane. Therefore, any other vector is going to be representable in terms of these two vectors, right. So, let us explicitly find that. So, you take the cross product and divide by its magnitude. You only care about this direction. You have found this direction which is perpendicular to the plane and now we can go ahead and use this information, right. So, V1, so if I take uh, the cross product of this vector v with, with respect to a, then only one of these two terms will survive. It is going to be v2 times b cross a because a cross a is 0. And then we are, uh, we can take the inner product, uh, the, the dot product, the dot, dot product of, you know, this equation on both sides with this uh, unit vector n. And then of course, the right hand side is going to be, you know, uh, uh, dot product of b cross a with, with respect to n, which will just be equal to modulus of a cross b with a negative sign, right. So, because a, a cross b is equal to minus b cross a. And then you just bring that to the other side and therefore, you are able to write down this explicit expression v2 is equal to minus dot product of this vector v cross a dotted with n and then you have to divide by a cross b. So, you have given any vector v and I am telling you what its component along b must be. I have to take a cross product of this vector with a and then 
dot it with this direction which I have defined for you because I know A and B and then I have to divide by this modulus of this A cross B. And likewise, we can go ahead and compute V1, the component of this vector V along the direction A, right? So that's just given by the dot product of V cross B with, with N divided by the modulus of A cross B. Right, so thus we have this explicit representation where I can write V as you know this component along A plus this component along B. Right, it turns out to be negative in this is the way I have written it, but basically the point is I have shown you explicitly what V1 and V2 are. Right, so what it tells us is if you are looking at two dimensional vectors, any two non parallel vectors are enough to give you every other, every other vector in this space, right? Although there are actually, there are infinitely many vectors in this space, right? So you, you, you're thinking of a box or a set of vectors, but the number of elements in this set is actually infinite. But you don't really, you don't need an infinite number of elements to represent any of these. It, there's a, you just, uh, you can represent it in terms of just two vectors. And those two can be any two vectors as long as they're not parallel. And right? that's what this is telling us. Of course, the coefficients that you can choose, V1 and V2, are, you know, there are infinitely many possibilities. So that's how you are able to generate an infinite number of vectors, an infinite space using just you know two vectors which which form what is called a basis. Right? I'm getting ahead of myself, but we will define this a little more precisely uh, in a future lecture. Okay, so next I want to define the concept of linear dependence, right? So I said, you know, I don't want these vectors which are parallel and so on, right? So that's where, uh, you know, the precise uh, uh, notion that we want to use here is that of linear dependence. So a set of vectors is said to be linearly dependent if some linear combination of them is zero, right? If they are parallel, then a linear combination of them is going to be zero, right? If on, on the other hand, okay, there we go. If on the other hand, if for a set of vectors, it's impossible to find such a linear combination that adds up to zero, then they are linearly independent. So yeah, so examples, you know, this EX, EY, and EZ are linearly independent vectors, right? So it's impossible to find a set of non-zero coefficients. You can of course take a zero times EX plus zero times EY plus zero times EZ equal to zero, that's possible. But the, the, the point is that whenever, if, if at all, there are, if, you, if you're looking for some three coefficients, AX and AY and AZ, such that AX, EX plus AY, EY plus uh, AZ, EZ, if that has to be zero, then AX equal to AY equal to AZ, they all three are zero. On the other hand, EX, EY and EX plus EY are linearly dependent because the third vector can be written as the sum of the, the first and the second. So you have this relation which makes them linearly dependent. Right, so this notion can be extended to abstract uh, linear vectors. So it's the, the definition is like what you would expect. Consider some n vectors, one, two, all the way up to n. They are linearly independent if, if the relation, summation over some, you know, product, or some coefficient a i, i, if this sum equal to zero necessarily implies that all these coefficients must be zero. The only way you can satisfy a relation like this is if all these coefficients are zero. Right? Then it means that you have pulled out a set of vectors which are linearly independent. So, and if a set of vectors is not linearly independent, then it becomes a linearly dependent set, right? So that's how you define a linearly dependent set. Now, so there is an immediate consequence of this, which I will show, and then we will stop with this lecture. So let, so if there are n non-null vectors, one, two, three, so on, all the way up to n, and if they are linearly dependent, then at least one of them can be expressed as a linear combination of the others. Right? I mean, it's it's not a surprise once you have seen the argument, but it, it, look at the, the way one develops uh, the argument systematically. Just for that purpose, that is instructive. Right? So we go back to the definition of 
linear dependence right so these vectors are linearly dependent you have n vectors so there for sure you will be able to find a set of coefficients a1 a2 all the way up to n and such that at least one of them must be non zero right if all of them are zero then that's not linear dependence right there is at least one of them which is non zero such that a1 1 plus a2 2 so on all the way up to a and n is zero now we are given for sure that at least one of these coefficients is non zero and so without loss of generality we can assume that a1 is non zero right you call that which is non zero as a1 and that vector corresponding to it will be one right then we can divide throughout so the point is that if there is one of these coefficients is non zero then it's legitimate to divide throughout by this coefficient a1 and then you can express one as minus 1 over a1 times all of this stuff on the right hand side of course all the other coefficients are free to be zero if they are zero then this vector one itself will turn out to be zero but the point is that and there is a division done with respect to uh, uh, division by a1 and a1 is taken to be non zero right and we are guaranteed that there is such an a1 right and that's why there is at least one vector which can be represented as a linear combination of all the other vectors in that set right you can have more than one of course right and so anyway it's it's uh, it's not a surprise when you when you have thought about this a little more and and you know got the flavor of what linear independence means what linear dependence means but uh, it's important to you know go over this systematically because we will use some of these properties will this notion very uh, critically will will show up in our discussions ahead right thank you that's all for this lecture